1 Corinthians chapter 7 is where we will be studying. This section is really uh, a middle holding together of the whole chapter 7, where Paul is dealing with singleness, marriage, the blessings, the burdens of both. And then we come to this section today, and he treats a broader topic, but dealing with uh, those who come from a Jewish background, those who come from a Gentile background, those who are in, enslaved, those who potentially are uh, slave owners, and how do we function in the body of Christ? And we're going to handle some of these uh, sensitive topics this morning. And what is the value of being content? Think about that. What is the value of contentment? You can have a lot of money, but you cannot buy contentment. I'm right on that, right? You, you, can, you just think about it. The on and on it goes of people who ha seem to have it all, and they don't have enough. Was it Rockefeller that was asked the question, how much money is enough? A little more. Just another dollar. need another dollar. And there are those who chase that dollar, and that chase comes to an end for all of us at the grave. And if that is what you live for, that is a very shallow existence that will fail in time to come. Contentment with our place, with our situation, our status in life, that's an important aspect of Christianity, to be able to say, it is well with my soul. Okay, that original hymn coming out of great tragedy, it is well with my soul. To be able to say that does not mean that everything is okay and fine. It means that I will be okay and fine because I belong to the one who is in care of my soul and he beat death. He conquered the grave. So since my master, the Lord Jesus, rose victorious from the grave, it is well with my soul. Whatever happens, whatever comes, whatever the diagnosis may be, whatever the slip may be, pink slip or whatever, whether it's a promotion or being let go, it is well with my soul. There's a push now, it's becoming popular, to live as a minimalist. All right, you familiar with this? Sell it all, get the wind stream, the little mini house, whatever, and just live with the smallest footprint you can on the grid, you know? Just go off the grid if you can. That's becoming more popular. And what, what's going on there? That's a discontentment with having too much. So I have less. I'm not content. We need to, I can get rid of some more. I can get rid of some more. It's a lack of contentment. On the other side of it is, I have to have one more acquisition. I need to earn one more. I need to work a little more overtime. More, 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 more. Buy another business. Acquire, acquire, acquire. And the, and the writer of Ecclesiastes, I think it's in the fifth chapter, puts these two positions against one another. Here's the person who's a day laborer. They work hard. They go home and they sleep because they're tired. And then you have the business owner. Or business, businesses, plural. They own more than one business. And, and they're growing, and that's great. And then suddenly they realize, I have five employees under me. I have 15. I have 50. I have 500 employees. And my decisions now, I can't sleep at night. Because if I make this purchase, that what, this could be good. This could be bad. And all of these people in the day labor seems to have the short end of the stick. He sleeps at night because he just goes tomorrow, and he'll do his job. And the person who seems to have it all is fit to be tied because they can't sleep now with the pressures weighing in on them. You understand the difference? So if our joy comes from what we have, who we are, what we own, that joy is suspect. It, it will be taken and removed. It will be lost. If it's in our health, good grief, right? If it's in our looks, well, Lord help us, okay? It's got to be in something greater, something greater. So then how do we, how do we work between... I need to be a minimalist. I need to have nothing, and, and I need to have everything. And, and so as a Christian, are you saying that we shouldn't just have anything? We should have no possessions? Is that, is that what the Bible teaches? No, that's not what the Bible teaches. And Paul is using this section to do a little bit of a timeout for people who are in one situation in life, looking at the grass on the other side of the fence, thinking, I need to be over there, and if I could be over there, then I would be happy. I could really be used to the Lord if I was over there. Paul is saying, stop, it doesn't mean that your situation in life will not change, should not change, but do not be in a rush to change that situation and that standing in life. Let God's will unfold in our lives rather than forcing things to happen. 
So it's a challenge. How to be a good steward, how to use what God has given me to be a faithful steward and not to simply go bury my talent in the ground so that here's your talent back. No, we want to be faithful stewards. Is the Bible's teachings devoted to give Christians the edge they need to gain health, wealth, and prosperity? No. Isn't that funny when you see both teams praying, Lord, you know, help us to win. All right, well, whose side is God on? Neither. He's to be glorified by all believers on both sides, live, play, serve to the glory of God. What about slavery? This section of our study today deals with slavery. Does the Bible endorse the type of slavery that we're familiar with in our nation and in our history? Predominantly in the South, no. But there are some who claim that, well, Jesus and, and the apostles and the writers of Scripture, they didn't do enough to end slavery. So therefore, in the view commonly of an atheist or an agnostic, if, the, if Jesus and the apostle Paul, if he didn't make a social justice stand here, if he didn't bring slavery to an end, if he didn't devote himself to that, well then then the God of the Bible is somehow morally inferior to a person making this assessment. Therefore, I don't need this book. And they, they cast it aside, and there are many who do that. How do you answer these important questions? Upon what basis do people make any moral judgment? And what is the standard for us to all live by? Is it your standard? Is it the atheist standard? Is it the agnostic standard? Is it my standard? Is it your opinion? Is it my opinion? Or is there something better than that? Thank the Lord, yes, there is. It's Scripture. It's the Word of God. Now, one can easily understand with just this brief setup here that the Corinthians had some legitimate questions to ask Paul. They had some serious questions to ask him for him to address in the first century. They lived in Corinth. It was a crooked and perverse city. We've compared it to Las Vegas, New Orleans, you know, during a Mardi Gras, just you name it, it's all going on to the Super Bowl. They say what goes on surrounding the Super Bowl is just gaining in sex slavery, all kinds of just horrific, unimaginable things that go on with entertainment. You don't have to look far. You look in the lives of politicians and all that goes on. It's, it's just corruption everywhere. So we're not that far removed from Corinth. Should we conform to the culture? Should we give our lives to see the culture changed? See, here's a risk. Jesus and the apostles and the church, we're to be devoted to the gospel. The gospel is the hope. It's the only hope of any nation, to any, any people. If you simply change the laws of the land, but you don't change the hearts of the people, you haven't ultimately changed anything. It won't last. So Jesus, the apostles, the writers of Scripture, the church, Christians, we are to remain focused on that which is most important, which is the gospel. It's how, and you think about the early church, were there, were there prostitutes called, saved out of the local temple? Were there men who used to visit the local temple? Now they're believers, they're in the church. Paul says, and such were some of you. They're all together, some out of the Roman military, some out of slavery, some out of all of these. And they're all gathered together in the church. And there's the title of the message. There's beauty in this. We're not all the same. We don't think the same. We don't look the same. We don't come from the same backgrounds. We don't have the same opinions on everything. And that is beautiful. That's the way it should be. But where we should unite comes under the clear teachings of Scripture. So Paul is very careful in how he deals with these issues so that their contentment comes from a confidence in Christ, not from a confidence in their heritage, a confidence in their accomplishments, a confidence in anything humanly, but it's a confidence in Christ, in Christ alone. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17 is where we will begin. And Paul says this, he says, But as God has distributed to each one 
As the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Let's ask the Lord for help. Father, as we have heard your living word, will you cause our attention to be fixed upon the message of your word? Will you soften the hearts that are here that are hardened? Will you strengthen the hearts, the minds, and lives of those who are here and they are downtrodden? Father, will you conform us to the image of Jesus, your Son? Would you be pleased today, Lord, to save those who have never repented and trusted in you? We would ask you to do this today. Will you use me as your servant? May I not get in the way, but let my mouth rightly declare your word. And may we honor your word, and may honor be given in the right way to its proclamation. For Jesus' sake, amen. As Paul writes here, he's dealing in this centerpiece of this passage. He's talking to these people who are from all different backgrounds, and this is a conglomeration the world would look on and say, what a joke. You're part of that? Who wants to be part of that group? You're nobodies, not many wise, not many noble. Remember that? This is God's plan. Paul broadens his treatment of contentment to address the various religious backgrounds, the national diversity within the church, as well as touching on the socioeconomic diversity there in Corinth. So we stop. We look at the bride that God is assembling, these people, And we can see how beautiful it is because of all of the different people. Is our joy, is our contentment this morning, is it found in people? Maybe a spouse or a lack thereof or in children or whatever it may be. Is our joy, is our contentment found in people? Is it in places? Is it in things or status or fame, family, circumstances? Because if my contentment is in any of those places, I'm guaranteed to lose it. I'm guaranteed I can't keep it. Oh, but if my contentment, if my joy is in Christ alone, will never be lost. So on the back of your worship guide, you'll see a place where you can put down the four ways, all right, from this passage, four ways that we as a people of God will give the portrait of contentment and how beautiful it is. Now, here's when it's beautiful, when the whole church, the whole church determines that in every situation, we will wholeheartedly, okay, so you have to have these things together. It's the whole church in Every situation, good times, bad times, we will wholeheartedly, not perfunctory, not just going through the motions, but from the heart, number one, trust the sovereign ruler who called us. Trust the sovereign ruler who called us. And we see this in verse 17. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. Let him walk there. Let us all be content in the Lord's assignment. You see, God is this, he's sovereign. 
He's sovereign over every detail in our lives. And we know from Romans 8.28 that God works together for good. All things together for good. To those who love Him, to those who are the called according to His purpose. God is sovereign. What does sovereign mean? It means no one tells you what to do. If you're the king, you're sovereign. A king doesn't have to ask anybody, hey, do you think I should? They would look at him and say, you're the king. Nobody tells you what to do. You're the king. And God is the king. He's sovereign. He's the sovereign ruler who called us. And Paul says, it is God who has distributed to each one. He's the one who divides to each one. You remember back when Joseph and his brothers came back with Benjamin? And he was testing them. They finally returned with him. And so he brings them to his own place. And there in Genesis 43, he can't, he's an Egyptian. They're Hebrews. So they're separated because the Egyptians despised Hebrews. They didn't know he's their brother. So he's in his place eating. He's watching them and he seats them according to their age. That would have been unusual. How does he know who's related to who and how's the oldest? And Benjamin's here all the way to Reuben over here. And they bring out the portions. Here you go, Reuben, all the way down the line, the line a portion, a portion. And then they get to Benjamin. They get to Benny. And here's a portion. Oh, wait, wait. And here's the second portion. Oh, wait a second. And here's the third portion. And here's the fourth. But wait, there's more. I mean, it's like old country buffet or whatever. And they're just filling up. And then Joseph is watching them. As he looks at Benjamin with five times the portion. And he's seeing, he's doing one of these checks of the pulse to his brothers to say, are you still the same as when you sold me for the price of a slave? Are you jealous of your brother, my brother? And the Bible says that they enjoyed the company and they enjoyed the meal together. And Joseph says, okay, maybe we're getting somewhere. And you all know, if you've ever worked with kids, when they pour, if you're running out of the pitcher of whatever, and you have two cups and there's two kids or three, then what do they do? Pour, pour, pour. Poor, poor, uh, wait, oh, oh, it's out. All right, let's check the levels. Oh, this one's down, poor little, poor little. Why? It has to be fair. And God forbid if you pour kid number one this much and then the next two get these, you're just, you, be, you better run for the hills, right? You better go to the store and get some more because it's not fair. You can't do that. We were playing Uno a week ago. And we're sitting in the camper and we're playing Uno. And I handed out the cards. Lola counted up her cards. You gave me eight. That's one more. I said, no, everybody got eight. Let's play the game. Oh, okay. That's not fair, right? Who's the one dividing? That's what Paul is saying. Paul, God is the one who divides. He's the one who gives all that we have. So let me ask you this question. What did you have to do with the family you were born into? You know, the standing of your family, the last name, the wealth. What did you have to do with that? Nothing. Nothing at all. How about the physical stature that you have? How tall you are? How maybe not tall you are? Politically correct way to say that, all right? Um, your physical features, the abilities you've been given, how fast you can run. What did you have to do with that? Nothing. Nothing. In the same way, what did you have to do with coming to faith in Christ, a new birth? Nothing you received. God is the one who gives. He's sovereign over all things. He's the one who opens the eyes of the blind, who called Lazarus, who is dead, to life. And he responded because the life-giving word spoke. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. Now we're going to come to the spiritual gifts in chapter 12. What did you have to do with the spiritual gifts that you have if you're in Christ? Nothing. God is the one who said you and you and you have the ability and you and he's the one who gives as he wills because he's sovereign. He's God. There is no God like our God, the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. He reigns over all. 
all times, all people, all places, all nations, he reigns. So Psalm 46, 10, you know, we have it on our wall. And on our wall, it's kind of, you would read, be still and know that I am God. But that's really not Psalm 46, 10. The nations are raging. And out comes the psalmist's voice, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. Whoa. That leads us to worship. He's God. He doesn't ask permission of kings, of emperors, of queens, of presidents. He is God. And he's working all things according to the counsel of his will. So Job says in Job 121, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away poor me. Is that what he said? No. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. I'll bless the name of the Lord. Does that mean that Job was just dismissing his trial that he was going through? No. He was being honest, but he was blessing God in all of it. So not only are we to be content, let us be content with our, the distribution that the Lord has given, our assignment, but let us be content in the Lord's calling. He's the one who has called us. The Greek word kaleo, is used eight times in various forms in this passage, in these verses. I think Paul wants to hit the nail home. We're called, we're called, we're called, we're called. We're called to be saints. Know your identity in Christ. There's many roads to the cross, but beloved, there's only one road to heaven. There's a lot of different backgrounds of people in Corinth 2,000 years ago, but there's only one way for those Corinthians to be in the presence of the Lamb who was slain right now. And it was Jesus. He called us in sovereign grace. John Newton writes, amazing grace. And he says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." Now, that, that might say, oh, that's a bad thing. And grace my fears relieved. See, you have nothing to be relieved of if you don't hear the message of, I'm a sinner and I deserve to die. I deserve hell. Was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fear said no, there's someone that did something about your sin it's Jesus in his grace he died for you so either you will be punished for your sins or Christ was punished for your sins but someone will be punished for our sins the question is who to repent and trust in Jesus is to have your debt paid in full, which is amazing grace. Lead the life the Lord has assigned to us. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying walk, All right, walk. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. It means to walk about or to be occupied. Now, when I was a kid, I was a daydreamer. I wish there would have been an award for daydreaming because I would have won that thing. I would sit at my desk and I would think about everything known to man and not known to man. And I would go home every night with homework upon homework. And my parents would ask me repeatedly, why didn't you do your work in school? Um, I just, my brain was flying everywhere. When I was put on a task, mowing the grass, doing whatever, I'm all in. I'm all there. I'm walking about it. I'm occupied with it. And then people would ask me, you want to be a pastor like your dad? I'm like, wait a second, study all day? No, I don't think so. But I'll do whatever God has for me, whatever he wants for me. And he's helped me in my weakness. To be occupied with. You see, there's a temptation here to think, you know, if I was to quit my job, and then I could go into the ministry, then my life would really count for something. Then I would be somebody. But I want you to understand, do you see how Paul links calling to ordinary careers, ordinary places in life? So if you are here and you're a homemaker, or you're a nurse, or you're a teacher, or you're a landscaper, or whatever it is that you do, Paul is helping these people to see, yes, he's an apostle. He has gifting for ministry, but he's not a greater person. 
His life isn't worth more than those who are called as slaves who impact the people around them. Whatever you do, a contractor, a builder, whatever, do to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10.31 says. And you need, to, you need to be able to realize this is my life calling and I will represent the Lord in this place. That's your place of ministry. Whatever it is that you do, that is, that's legal and ethical and right. So if someone comes to faith in Christ and they're the casino owner, they're going to have some serious things to think through. And what do I do? Can I represent Christ well in this environment? If somebody was a prostitute and easily understood in, first, in Corinthians time, there were probably those, they can't be that anymore. It's not right. So there is individuals that they had to come out of what their life was into obedience to the word of God. If you're a thief, can't, can't continue on. Well, you know, I was called as a thief. So want me to help you with the offering this morning? And I'm like, hang on, time out. You used to steal. Now God's given to you and you are to share with others. Oh, okay. There's been a correction. You think about somebody who's a drug dealer. Yeah, you know, I'm going to deal drugs for the, for the glory of God. No, you can't do that. There's going to be a change in your life. You're going to now live not to destroy people's lives, but to help people. What can we do for the glory of God? Can I ask a, a question? Are you okay? And am I okay with God being God? Now you might say, well, that's kind of a silly question. Well, let me back this up. Have you ever complained about your situation? Have you ever coveted the place and position of another person? Then what happens when we do this? We're guilty of saying, you know, I just need to scoot the Lord off that throne just for a little bit, and I need to call some shots here. I need to make some changes. The Lord really isn't, he's not really doing what I think he should be doing. And if someone doesn't understand that, if they don't recognize that, then they will be hurtful. It will, they will hurt themselves, and they will hurt others. I want to help us in this. I want God to use me to help us in this, to have a contentment to where we are able for the glory of God to fully trust in the ruler, the ruler who has called us. He is sovereign. Secondly, that we would obey the Apostle Paul's rule. All right, he lays down a rule here about our calling. And in verse 17, 20, and 24, he says three times the very same rule. And he says, and so I ordain in all the churches, let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Verse 17, verse 20, verse 24, this is his rule. This is his, uh, what he uh, ascribes to not just the Corinthian church, but to all churches. In short, Paul is saying, don't be in a rush to change your place in life. If you're single, don't be in a rush to hurry up. I got to get married. And, and then if I'm married, I'll be content. Well, I'm married. And boy, if I wasn't married anymore, if I was single, then I would be content. Or, you know, this, this job I have and this blue collar job, if I could get up there into upper management, then I'd be happy. Upper management, oh, this is driving me crazy. And it's just occupying my mind. If I could be back in the, in the workforce, I wouldn't have all this stress. So ah, let's just make a hurry up offense change here. I'm a rich person, and now I've come to faith in Christ. You know what? Let me just give all my money away, and, and, and then now I'm poor. And hey, um, you guys, can, can you help me? I, I don't have any money. Or a poor person to hurry up, and I need to get rich. And hey, I think I can do that playing the lottery. You know, and, and see what happens there. Yeah, be, be careful in there. Caution. Living with a thought, if only, and then you could fill in the blank. Well, if only this, if only that, if only I had good health. Well, if only, beloved, only Christ can fully satisfy the longings of our hearts. It's foolish to think that discontentment can be satisfied by a change of marital status, by a change of employment, by a change of fame or social status, well, if I just got a different house, change my address, that, that'll make a difference. 
You know, if I was just a little more prettier and, and, and our young people are seeing all these images around, if I could just be like them, then I would be, I would be content. Or if I was just smarter, you know, if I could just be the top of the class, then, then I would be happy. Then I would have joy. Then I would be content. Listen, whatever else that's not of Christ alone, you fill in the blank. It, it will let you down. There's no contentment to be found in that. A week ago, a famous golfer was arrested. He was drunk behind the wheel. I'm wondering, when you see tragedy like this, how do you see that? Some people might find it as a joke. Some people see it as just, you know, jealousy or whatever it may be. But do you see it as tragic? That someone who has so much seems to have nothing and is broken? Do you see it as brokenness that points to the truth we're studying today? That our deepest need cannot be met by championships, relationships, accomplishments. Our deepest and greatest need is directly and fully met in the gospel of the Lord Jesus. That's the only place that our deepest need can be met fully. When Paul writes to the Philippians, Philippians 4.11, he says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Are you content? Are we content? So, Pastor, are you saying, is Paul saying that we should have no ambition in life? Just be content. What is biblical and understanding of stewardship? That's what Paul is dealing with, and he touches on this in the next section. In our third, our third way, if we're going to display this portrait of beauty, of contentment by God's people, the whole church, in every situation, wholeheartedly, then number three, when we value every Christian related to our calling. We value every Christian, every believer related to our calling. We're all very different, yet God, the sovereign ruler, has made, has called us as believers to be saints. And so we are all, and Paul lays this out, we are one in Christ. We are one in Christ. Verses 18 and 19, he addresses on these different backgrounds. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be uh, circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Man-made tradition now at this point does not matter. God's commands those that is what matters. We are to live for. We are one in Christ. In the gospel, the Lord Jesus dissolves the ethnic and religious backgrounds when someone comes to faith in Christ. Well, I'm a Jew. I'm a Gentile. Well, in Christ, we're one. We're one. This sign of circumcision given to Abraham, a sign of the old covenant. Paul is saying now it's a no thing. It's been replaced with, surpassed by the new covenant. That could never be done in the, the skin. It's done in the heart. Early on in Christianity, the issue of well, what do we do with Gentiles? Gentiles were coming to faith in Christ, and what do we do with them? Are they supposed to go through the same uh, conversion poly- practices that we brought somebody into Judaism? How do we do this? Acts 15, the chapter deals with what do we do? And the church came to the understanding of no. They do not need to be circumcised because that is adding a physical activity to grace. And whenever you add a work, whether it be baptism, you have to take communion, you got to go through this, you got to go through that. If you add anything to salvation, you pollute grace. So the early church said, no. God saves Jews and Gentiles in the same way. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, Paul deals with this in the church at Galatia. They were trying to bring people all back into Judaism and bring Jesus with us, but you can't do that. It comes to Titus. Titus was a a Greek. Titus 2 verse 3. 
Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And he says, false brethren, they came in, they're spying out the liberty. And they say, he, you have to have him circumcised. And Paul answers in verse 5, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour. Well, why not, Paul? That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. God shows no personal favoritism. For those in the end of verse 6 who seem to be something added, nothing to me. He's, they're trying to get Titus to, he needs to go through this practice. And Paul says, no way. Because that has nothing to do with salvation. When it came to Timothy, Timothy's father was a Jew. Paul said, son, you're going to have to be circumcised because people are going to doubt. They're going to think that you are, are shunning your heritage. How is that going to help us relate to Jewish people if they think that you're ashamed of being Jewish? Can't do that. So you need to be, because it has nothing to do with the gospel. It has everything to do with being able to engage with people and not have a stumbling block before you get to that. So Paul says you stand firm in grace. Look at Galatians 3, verse 26. Galatians 3, 26, Paul writes, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And that's where we get the song. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had father, right arm, left arm, right? And that song goes on and on forever. Gets in your mind. That's what he's talking about. Physically, I didn't descend from Abraham. Spiritually, I'm a child of the promise. A child of Abraham. Go to Galatians 5. The first verse in chapter 5, he writes, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Don't go back into the workspace that doesn't save. You were saved out of that. And there are times when people come to faith in Christ and then they remember back to they used to do this and they used to go through that and they remember all of the rituals and all of the routines and they kind of miss that. And there are times when people go back into that. Paul's saying, don't. That was all a picture. It was a picture of Christ. Christ has come. You have the real thing now. So do you want a shadow of your child or do you want your child? Do you want a shadow of your wife or do you want your wife? The shadow is great. But if someone comes up and you're hugging the shadow, they might call for security quickly. If your loved one is standing right there and you're making a big do to do about the shadow, there are many things that were shadows. Christ came that displaces and surpasses the shadow of the things to come. That's what Paul is dealing with. Stand in the grace. Don't budge. Don't give up. We've been called to liberty. So in chapter 6 of Galatians, in verse 15, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a... Here's what matters. A new creation. A new creation that you've been born again. Now we go back to 1 Corinthians 7. You need to know that human preferences and opinions are just that. They might be helpful. Well, minimalist, yeah, that's what we need to do. They might also be dangerous. So Paul is very careful in dealing with these sensitive topics here. But when other people offer their opinions on, well, how you should read your Bible, what plan you should use, how many minutes a day, and what translation you should use, and how much you should give, and should we tithe, or we don't tithe, or all of these things. And, and someone begins to say, well, I'll take the, the difficult areas that require people to pray and seek God's face, and I'll just work that all out for you. And here's what it is. This is what you wear. This is what you do. This is what you give. And this is the way. Danger, danger, danger. The opinions that people have over rearing children or should you public school or homeschool or private school or what about your kids dating and what's the way or courting? No, that's the way. All of these issues. Listen, beloved, if you don't have a book, chapter and verse, then you have your opinion and you must be very careful in that. 
You must not go around taking opinions and elevating them to the place of Scripture. And when it comes to circumcision, uncircumcision, all of these things, that's what was going on, and that's what Paul is dealing with in the church at Corinth. As a church, we stand against this type of rulemaking and list-keeping because as the Pharisees, they were well-known for doing this in Jesus' day. And they were so offended at Jesus breaking their rules. He broke our rules. He broke our rules. Remember what he asked? For, for what crime, for what deed, for what act, for what miracle are you calling for my death? Oh, no, not for that. But you claim to be the son of God. And they had to lie to convict him using scoundrels. Liars, people who could be bought. And then he rose from the dead. Messed that plan up. In his greatest, what appeared to be defeat, he defeated our enemy. Oh, praise, the, praise God for that. They completely, the Pharisees, lost sight of God's word. And they were on about breaking the law of God because Jesus broke their rules. How odd is that? Do you ever think about that? You shall not commit murder. You shall not bear false witness. They slaughtered the law of God because Jesus broke their rules. That's a sign of being a Pharisee. Keeping God's commandments is what Paul then says. That's why he adds that in there. That's the thing. Circumcision, not circumcision, it's a no thing. Keeping your rules, that's a no thing. It's not to be worked out and worked on. Opinions are no things. God's word, God's commands, now that's the thing. That's what we're concerned with. Love God, love people. That's what Jesus was asked. What's the greatest commandment? Love God, love people. On this hangs the whole law. Not only are we one in Christ, but we're equal in Christ. And we see this in verses 21 and 22. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who has called us in, uh, called is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. Male and female, slaves and free, are all equal in Christ. We're one in Christ. We're equal in Christ. Calvin says about this, he says, this, is, this statement is designed to furnish consolation to servants and at the same time to beat down the haughtiness of those that are freeborn. He's elevating the slaves and those who are, I'm free. Nobody tells me what to do. Uh, you're going to need to be humbled. You're a slave to Christ. And oh, what a master we have in Christ. He's a good master. Slaves, don't obsess. Don't obsess about obtaining your freedom. If you have the opportunity to get your freedom, like when he writes to Philemon about Onesimus. Now he's a brother. He's a son in the faith. And, and, and it, there's a way, if you can forgive him, forgive his debt, then do so. But if you cannot, then live out your life for Christ where you are and influence others in that realm for God willing all eternity. Take courage. Rejoice. You belong to Jesus. You're the Lord's freedman. You're free in Christ. So I can quit my slavery? No. And we have to understand that in the first century, the slavery wasn't like the slavery in most cases that we experience in this nation. And also through the gospel, laws and nations have been changed. It's important for us to know that. The risk is that we take our eyes in going after social justice and we take our eyes off the gospel. That's why Jesus, that's why Paul and the apostles did not abandon the saving gospel, which matters for all eternity, to change some laws that would matter for some decades. So it's not that it's pointless and worthless. But we must have the right perspective that we understand the gospel changes lives of all free slaves. And do you know, in our world right now, the estimates have slavery to be at its greatest point as it has ever been. And there are movements like End It Movement, uh, men like David Platt, Francis Chan, John Piper, who are calling attention and calling the church to make a difference. Make a difference. Change lives. Engage. Not only are we one in Christ, equal in Christ, but we are also beloved in Christ. 
We are beloved in Christ. We are bought at a price. Same as what he wrote in 1 Corinthians 6.20. We've been purchased. We've been bought with the blood of Jesus. Believers, listen, you've been bought. You've been set free. Therefore, do not become slaves of men. Don't make foolish decisions spiritually. Don't subject yourselves to the opinions of other false teachers and immature believers. You're like, come here, can I talk to you? Do you think that that's right? What book, chapter, and verse? Well, I don't have a book, chapter, and verse, but I think that this and I think that that. Hey, hold up, time out. Time out. Stop. Stop already. Don't be subjected to that. And also, when it comes to our financial decisions, you have to be careful, be wise to not put yourself into a position of you can't pay your bills. Be careful. Don't rob God. Malachi 3. Where have we robbed God? You're not giving to the Lord. So bring tithes into the storehouse of the Lord. Don't, well, I got to take care of this and I got to take care of that. My kids got this camp and that camp and I got to do all this. Ah, I got nothing left for the Lord. Backwards. Give to the Lord first, give to him of your best, and trust him with the rest and make those decisions. If God's people give in a way that honors the Lord, the work will be provided for. The Lord will bless, the Lord will provide. Lastly, enjoy the divine rest in our calling. We see in verse 24, he just sums it up again. And he uses this loving term, brethren. You know, Philadelphia, brotherly love, brethren. Let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Brethren, hey, we're believers. We're brothers. We're sisters in Christ. We're joined together in one family by one spirit under one Lord. We are the beloved. We are the recipients of God's love, of his grace and his mercy. And we are his conduit. We're his chosen method to bring his grace, his mercy, his love to the world. We're the beloved in Christ. Our eternal calling far surpasses any temporary standing, whether poor or rich. You could preach this message in a prison, this message preached to free people. Our eternal calling far surpasses any temporary standing, whether black or white, male or female. To be in Christ is to be in the beloved, is to enjoy the rest in our calling. Our eternal calling in life and for all eternity, it sets the direction for day-to-day living. We have been called to be saints. When saints joyfully live out their temporary calling as God uses them in those environments, in those places, whether bond or free, then that's when the light penetrates the darkness like Jesus was speaking about in Matthew 5, 16. That's when 1 Peter 3.15, when people say, um, excuse me, what's the hope that you have in you? You got a bad diagnosis and you still love this God and you still serve this God. How does that happen? Can you explain that to me? When the whole church wholeheartedly goes through every circumstance, trusting the sovereign ruler who called us and obeying the Apostle Paul's rule about our calling and valuing every believer related to our calling and enjoying the divine rest in our calling. When we reside there, then we're salt and light. And people say, what's the difference about you? And who is this God that you serve? But when some of the church, some of the time, and in some situations are not at rest, God does not look glorious to non-believers. The portrait of contentment in Christ alone is demonstrated beautifully when we all as a people of God say, all right, Lord, I see your word. I understand your word. Now help me obey your word. Help me. Give me the grace to live out your word and be a witness in whatever stage. Are you retired? Then you're not going to hear this message. I got to go back to work. No. Work for the Lord. All of our days are numbered. Use your life and use your free time for the glory of God. Whatever stage of life we're in. What's your takeaway? You remember, as he says right here, brethren, let each one remain with God. 
And what did Jesus say in His parting words? And lo, I am with you always. Hey, slaves in Corinth, God is with you just as He was with Joseph. Live for the glory of God and you let the outcome be in His timing, not yours, just like Joseph. God sent me here, brothers. God sent me here to save many people alive. You meant it for evil and God meant it for good. Covered him with grace, covered him with love, covered him with kindness and demonstrated he lived out this principle of being confident and content and ready for what God would open. Is that how you're living? By God's grace, we embrace that today. If you've never come by faith and trusted in Christ, maybe today, maybe today is the day you trust in him. Will you stand with me? Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the truth. I thank you that you build up right thinking, you build up right behavior and you break down, you tear down what is wrong, you cut out what is bad, you deal with our sin, you deal with our stubbornness, you deal with our discontentment. You graciously, faithfully deal with us as sons and daughters. And to those who are enemies here, they've never come by faith and trusted you. You're calling to them today to come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, rest for your souls. So may we hear your word by your spirit and respond in obedience today and always. For Jesus' sake, amen.